Film 2001 in half an hour after BBC One erupts. How's this for a job? When you get onto a part of the world that seems to be breathing, there's cracks, there's gas coming out of the cracks, it'll shake every now and again. It really is part of the earth that is living. It's a constant game of Cluedo. I'm going out, gathering all the information, and then coming up with who put the knife in the back of the butler. There is a flute still rising up above the It's a fascination with this, this constant battle of wits. Observatory leaving, exclusion zone now. Dr. Mark Davis works in the most hostile landscapes on this earth. A leading volcanologist, he's witnessed the destructive powers of volcanoes throughout the world. Later on this field trip, he'll realize a long-held dream, taking on Colombia's deadly Nevada del Ruiz, a volcano that wiped out a population in minutes. But first, he must renew his acquaintance with Montserrat's Soufriere volcano. In 1996, Mark was part of a team of experts who called for the evacuation of 5,000 people from beneath its spewing crater. The volcano continues to menace, holding the tiny Caribbean island within its grip. Only constant monitoring will keep the remaining population safe. Every um, six months or so now I come back and uh, I continue to do this gravity survey which um, is only a couple of us in the world that sort of specialise with, with this type of survey. So I'm back this time and, and we want to get some data quite in close to the volcano because it's begun to erupt again. So uh, it's, it's poking a great big spine out of the top of the dome and it could collapse at any time. <laughs> Gravity measurements, they have to be done pretty much on top of the volcano itself. It'll be a very, very well-planned operation. The seismic team will be in the observatory. The helicopter will be on standby. I'll be working as a buddy-buddy system. So when I go up, it's not go up willy-nilly. It really is a calculated risk. You know, I just want to get the data and, and, and get out. When activity is high, as it is now, gaining close-range data is vital. But working at the edge of the volcano is hazardous. It's mood, treacherous. Wow, you can see, look at that. You can see the spine on top of the dome there. Absolutely amazing. That, that believe it or not, is what was magma and is now sort of lava. It's part of the dome and it, it's a bit like um, squeezing toothpaste up through a toothpaste tube. And it squeezed its way all the way up through the dome, this whole great big area here. And, uh, and you can see it's, I don't know, 70 feet high, whatever. It's just waiting to collapse at any time. And when it collapses, it's going to give one heck of a display of pyroplastics. Now, what you see down in, on the bottom, across here, all that white stuff that's come down is all volcanic ash. It's come from these great big pyroplastic flows, these hot ash clouds that come down. And it's just disintegrated all the vegetation. Are you ready to go down there, George? OK. OK. It's not to be. Ash clouds could kill the engine of the helicopter. A drop of rain would dampen the dry conditions. With the elements against Mark, he has to be content with landing further down the slopes of the volcano. Mark's used to working quickly, taking a range of complex readings to measure the build-up of gas and molten rock underground. The data reveals the magnitude of the awesome forces stirring below and predicts what the volcano will do next.
when people say to me, you know, describe volcanoes for me, it's impossible. Every volcano has its own character, and this one, um, it's just like, it is, it's sinister. You look up, you see all the scars as if it's, you know, it's scarred itself and dragged its claws up the sides of the volcano. And in those scars, there's, you know, there's, there's, there's steam and ash coming out of those scars. It's absolutely fantastic. And I would get that pyroclastic flow coming down up there now. Observatory Mike Delta, I see it. It's coming down Tar River Valley. It's quite a big rock fall. Um, I'll keep you posted, over. This is uh, a baby rock fall, but um, nonetheless, it's quite impressive. It's rocks have come from the top and it's sort of come down and it's generated quite a mini pyroclastic flow. And that flow's not gone very far, but you already see the amount of ash that is generated on the top of the volcano. It, uh, it's a majestic sight. It looks like cotton wool buds. Temperature of that ash cloud will be around about 400 degrees C, I should think, somewhere along that. Pyroclastic flows are killers. Caught in their path, there's no chance of survival. Travelling at 100 miles per hour, they can't be outrun, as 19 months of rations found to their cost. In 1995, amidst the Caribbean's hurricane season, the population of Montserrat found themselves dealing for the first time with an erupting, angry volcano. Mark joined the specialist monitoring teams at the height of its activity. I don't want to portray a macho man image, you know, I'm, I haven't any fear going onto the volcano. I have, I've, I've got every fear in the book. Do I actually think about death? Inevitably it goes through your head, you, you do realise that you can die. Do I want to go? No. <laughs> I'm absolutely scared that death can be quite horrific. Probably I began to be obsessed with volcanoes when I was quite young. Back in 1985, there was this um, disaster in Nevado del Ruiz in Colombia, and this disaster actually killed 25,000 people. I couldn't understand at the age of 15 how we could put man on the moon, but we couldn't stop Mother Nature from creating a catastrophe. You know, I wanted to do something about it, but I wasn't going anywhere in life and there wasn't much that I could actually do. Mark left school without qualifications. It took him 10 arduous and determined years to become a volcanologist and achieve his doctorate. I love coming back to uh, this island because <clears throat> the monster Ashens themselves are um, incredibly warm people. Um, remind me a lot of Welsh people in a way because, uh, you know, we come down and uh, they just make you totally feel at home. And uh, Moose's Bar there, you know, you go in and his wife cooks for us and help ourselves to, to be his in his fridge and it's all done on a trust basis. It's, it's just great, it's a fantastic atmosphere to be in. The, and there, it's quite a sharp contrast, you go from this lovely sort of green area, uh, quite lush vegetation, and then you go over the exclusion zone and um, you just go into this nuclear winter, this, this sort of barren, grey, talcum powder landscape and it's, it's quite a contrast, it really is. So this is it, this is uh, downtown Plymouth. It's where everyone used to congregate and, and have their soirees. And uh, that clock tower, up to the arches that you can just see buried is about five meters. It was a massive clock tower. And underneath it was the cenotaph and the base station for all the gravity measurements. 
So I used to come here and hang out. And there used to be a guy over there that used to do all the uh, um, all the ferry stuff. And the ferry bar used to be that thing that's buried just across there. And he used to come across and say, Yaman is a bit uh, hot, Carib. Pretty much every time I swig a bottle of Carib, you know, I sort of reminisce and think about things like that. The only way I can describe this place is like a nuclear holocaust. It reminds me of Mad Max beyond the Thunderdome, you know? I mean, you can't get a feel for how much destruction's actually gone on here. This door, for example, which is just, just over here, is uh, it's a second level door, that is. We're on, the, we're on the second floor, so it's been actually been, been quite buried. And you can get a feel from it from the top of that house just, just there. And it's, what's happened is that just pyroclastic flows and mud flows have just come down and uh, totally wiped out the, the, the whole of the capital, Plymouth. It's really difficult having a hobby that you love and balancing this sort of scene where you see the volcano destroying people. I think when I go to Nevada del Rio, it's, it's going to pretty much hit home in a big way. So I'm touched with, with a lot of sadness when I come down to this part of Plymouth, but when I go up to the northern part and see that, you know, monster ashes are upbeat, they're getting back on with their lives, it's, you know, the same jump ups, parties, the same drinking sessions are going on, you know, and, and that fills me with joy at the same time. With the volcano threatening increased activity, Mark is eager to gain data before leaving for Colombia. He needs just a shower of rain, but with only one day remaining, his hopes are fading. As you're aware, Tropical Storm Debbie is posing a threat to the Leeward Islands, including Montserrat. Sustained winds are near 70 miles per hour with higher gusts to the north and east of the center. It's expected to strengthen and become a hurricane later today or tonight. Well, yesterday I was hoping for rain to dampen down the ash. Well, I got my wish, but the only problem is it's um, a tropical storm that's heading straight for Montserrat. I can't do my measurements at this stage. The helicopter's actually flown off island to get out of the eye of the storm. The problem in volcanic terms is that um, too much rain and ash on top of the volcano will send stuff down. Um, it'll increase the chances of mud flows and lahars. Um, and also you've got the spine up there. And it, in the past, a lot of rain has actually dislodged the spine. So, um, You've just got to keep an eye on the volcano because, really speaking, when hurricanes go past, it's a lottery as to what's going to happen. absolute frustrating nightmare because first of all we had ash and I couldn't get in to do my measurements then we had the hurricane and off the back of the hurricane I'm back down in Bellum Valley and you can just see there's a there's a torrent running down it it's not quite a mud flow as yet because a mud flow normally carries these great big meat sized boulders within it at the moment there's only the sort of block sized boulders but it's still enough if you try to walk across it, it'll probably still break your ankle so that's why I can't go across and do those measurements I'm off tomorrow and uh, it'll be a, a week completely wasted. Tel Aviv. Hey. Hey. 
I've got to be honest, 15 years ago, I would never have thought that I'd be in Manizales and certainly not close to Nevada Del Rey's volcano. I'm hoping to do some measurements because if I do measurements, there's two things for that. I mean, gravity measurements are good anyway, and it'll be part and parcel of the volcano observatory's monitoring scheme. And also, at the same time, one of the good things with, with gravity measurements is that you're meant to use the same meter time after time after time, so it means that I get a chance to come back time after time, which is great. Hey, Dad, how are you? Hi, how nice are you? Meet you? Nice to meet you at Welcome last. To Thank you very much. So, when was this film? In 1986. 86. Yeah, this is the High in the northern Andes, Nevada del Ruiz was affectionately known as the Sleeping Lion. On Friday the 13th, 1985, the lion awoke and roared. Towns and villages were swept away by raging mud flows. 25,000 Colombians perished as they slept. From here we can see the, the volcano. But today, unfortunately, it's can't see it. So cover, but maybe in the afternoon we can see. I hope so. Yeah. We can yeah. see all the Manizales city. That's great. Just it? behind the chair and that yeah. hill, you, you can see there. Yeah, is well, the, the one volcano. In front. Right. Yeah. At 5,300 meters, five times higher than anything in Great Britain, the smouldering Nevada del Ruiz looms over the quarter of a million people who live beneath it. Marx brought life-saving monitoring equipment to donate to the Colombians, but first. He has more self-indulgent plans. I've got two loves in my life. I've got mountaineering and I've got volcanoes. The two go hand in hand, and I really want to get to the top of the volcano itself. That's the mountaineering part of it. So I want to get up the top of it, and the volcano side of me wants to actually peer over that crater and stare down the throat of that volcano. Because as a volcanologist, you speak to any volcanologist and they tell you, you get a kick out of actually looking down into the throat. There's all sorts of problems with that. I've got altitude problems, going from sea level all the way up to there. You, uh, altitude sickness is, is, is a massive problem. You can't get oxygen into your lungs, so when really speaking, I should spend a week actually acclimatizing. And the other thing is that I can't work out what the weather's doing. I've only been here um, sort of 24 hours or so, and the one minute it's the sun's shining, the next minute it's uh, raining. So trying to determine what the weather's gonna be doing is, is, yeah, you know, I can't do it. I don't know if Michael Fish could do it. The challenge is set, the duel begins. Volcanologist versus volcano. Mark heads out of town to see what he's up against. Oh, look at this landscape. Ah. That's what you, what you get with volcanoes that you don't get with any other type of landscape whatsoever. You can, be, you can be on one volcano and it'll give you like three or four different types of landscapes. Nowhere else on, on Earth. I mean, we come up, we've seen the sort of dense jungle, then we saw the, the cacti and the air plants, and then we come up and we see this sort of moonscape type stuff. Now we got snow, we're gonna get up to glaciers and, and ice. Uh, nowhere else in the world, apart from volcanoes, do you get landscapes like this. You can't explain it to anyone. Right, so where is it then, huh? Halfway around the world, 15 years I wanted to come to this place. It doesn't snow below the glacier, I'm told. The glacier's up there somewhere, Nevada del Rey's is up there somewhere, and I'm told that uh, it doesn't snow. Typical, absolutely typical. But I can see the sun. in this valley is nature at its most powerful. What happened back in 1985 was the, the eruption occurred and these pyroclastic flows came out of the top of the volcano and they were hot enough to melt the ice on, on the top of the volcano and that created mud flows and these mud flows came shooting down the side of the, the summit and it gradually gained momentum and by the time it got to here it was like thundering its way down enough to erode this whole valley 
just gouge the heart right down to this old valley. And the thing to think about is that the valleys back in Britain took 10,000 years during the last glaciation to form. This would have taken about 30 seconds. This mud flow came down through here. It deposited some of the mud. There's about 20 meters of mud there. And it just headed on all the way down the valley. And this valley leads down to our marrow. There's survivor accounts of this sort of moaning, grumbling monster coming towards them. And um, it just sort of entombed everyone pretty much in a, in a watery grave, you know, 25,000 people killed. Back in 1985, at the age of, a, you know, a cocky 15-year-old, you think, oh, yeah, fine, so what, you know. And then the new footage itself started showing this child that was stuck in one of these mud flows. This rescue of this child went on for about three days. And as the days went by, you could see the sort of life just, just being sucked right out of her and sort of three or four days later this child was dead sort of totally suffocated if monitoring equipment had been in place the story might have been quite different there's no doubt Nevada del Ruiz will erupt again but the mud flow detectors Mark has brought with him will now provide two hours warning crucial time to evacuate homes and ensure lives are not taken in the future. I think Milton's going to translate for me. So, um, first of all, I'd like to apologise for not speaking in Spanish, and I promise next time I come to work here, I'll speak Spanish. It's actually great to hand over these detectors. I've always wanted to do something about Amero, um, but I couldn't, obviously, you know, I, I couldn't do anything at that age. But now, this time round, um, these detectors are actually going to play a part of monitoring the volcano itself, which means that from now on, if there's a similar disaster and these lahars or these mud flows start coming down the side of the volcano, then these detectors are going to pick it up. So I don't feel that I've come full circle as yet. I've satisfied one of the ambitions, and that is to do something about the monitoring of the volcano. On behalf of the Open University Geological Society and the Jeff Brown Memorial Fund, I would like to present this equipment to Injaminus Menizales. Now I want to satisfy the other side of me, which is the curiosity side. I want to get up to the top of the volcano and start peering into that crater. Nevada del Ruiz awaits. Freezing temperatures, glacial crevasses, and unpredictable weather lie ahead. But Mark must fulfill his dream and finally face the beast, if it will allow him. So this is it, the morning of the, uh, the ascent. I, I, I hope the weather's going to be on outside. You know, safety-wise, I got my ice axe, my, my crampons, and, and the rope as well. And what people don't realise is I got my lucky clothes as well at the same time. Probably the most important thing for me is um, my fleece. I've had this since I was about 14. Every rip, every sort of, like, tear in it, it tells a story. And, uh, I mean, this, this was where someone pulled me out of a way with this great big boulder that came crashing down on Aranel Volcano. So um, I got all my lucky gear and... Uh, oh, yeah, one last thing. Can't stick flags on top of a volcano, but I can have a little bit of Welshness up there with my bob lat. I can get away with that. So, um, fingers crossed, it's, it's all down to the weather. I'm not very optimistic at the moment. It's absolutely hammering it down. It's, it's worse than Merthyr Tidville on a wet winter's afternoon, I think. I don't recommend running at altitude. This is a Japanese endurance event. One corner down, another 300 to go, I think. Hey, Reese, you look here. Are we doing it all the way to the top or what? Hey, come on, push, push! We made it. 
has got to be some of the best driving I've ever seen on slick tyres. So, uh, good old Reese here has got us all the way to the top. So it's now a small trivial matter of um, 1,000 metres up a glacier. So the weather's, um, well, you know, it's, it's still snowing a bit, but uh, what do you think, Milton? Will we get up the top? Yeah, yeah, yeah we so, are going to the top. So Milton is optimistic that we get all the way to the top. Whether I'll get a view or not is another thing. Yeah. Let's go. Many climbs in the Alps, very technical climbs, but this at altitude and um, not having had long enough to acclimatise is probably the uh, one of the hardest climbs I've uh, I've ever had to do, and it's it's not for a lack of um, trying to prepare as well. I, I I trained very very hard back in Britain, uh, running every morning, gymnasium every day as well, pushing the weights for. That's no substitute for coming here and spending two weeks and acclimatising first because you just can't get enough air into your lungs. And you're coming up and you're thinking, oh God, what am I doing? But then all of a sudden you turn around and someone shouts and you see views. Fantastic, absolutely fantastic. I've sat 5,000 metres up in the air on Nevada del Rey's 15 years. I wanted to come here for 15 years, you know. Milton said, what's, what's it like? And I, I just can't, I can't convey how I feel at the moment in words. It's just... <laughs> what a sight. Absolutely, what a sight. Mark finally reaches the crater's edge. But cloud moves in. Visibility is zero. Nevada del Ruiz has played the trump card. I don't care where it was. If there's anything such as volcano gods, it's on this volcano, because... We just dropped down. We had, we had this exhausting walk all the way up today. Coming back down, wiped out, didn't see a thing. I smelt it, I could touch it, I could even taste the sulphur. I was on there, I was on the edge of the crater, but I couldn't see a thing. It was like Snowden on a winter afternoon. And we just dropped in down, coming down in the car now. And there you go, the whole of the glacier is clear. And if the glacier is clear, clear the crater is going to be clear. And I, I am absolutely devastated. Devastated. It's not. It's not enough daylight to go back up. I wouldn't mind going back up, and I fly out tomorrow. So it's making sure that I come back again. That's what the volcano is doing. It's playing games with me. The Alaskan wilderness provides the challenge for mountain men, Saturday at ten past eight on BBC Two. Next tonight on BBC One, Film 2001. Mark Davis and the director of Volcano Man, Alison Quinn, are online now. Talk to them at bbc.co.uk slash live chat.